I'm good. Forgive, forgive my uh, tech glitch. Uh, all right, what's going on, everybody? I'm going to share my screen because we got a lot of tactical stuff to share with you guys today. Can you see that? Okay, Rach. Yep. Okay, awesome. So. Um, Awesome to be with everybody today. We want to go ahead and invite you to be part of the conversation today. We're recording this for people to watch in the future, but if you have the, a question, I'm guessing those people watching will likely have the same questions. So throw them up in the chat box. Rachel will bring them up and we'll talk about them in real time as we go through this. In a Q&A. Yep. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, but today we're talking about mastering personal and business finances. And for those that got on just a couple minutes before we started, we we're just kind of chatting back and forth. Like this is a topic we've considered doing for about a year now. It's not the sexy, cool stuff like lead conversion, lead sources, consultations. Presentations, yeah. yeah, it's it's not sexy like that, but it's super freaking important and it's not talked about very often. So today um, we want to really open up our business to you and share with you what we've done over the last six years to find success in the financial areas of our business. We've been entrepreneurs like literally since we got out of high school. I'm 38 years old and I've owned three different companies over that 20 year period of time. I've learned the hard way what to do and what not to do with money. And I want to share with you some of those lessons today. Okay. So we basically broke down eight wealth building rules that we have developed and that we personally follow. And I want to share those rules with you today. Okay. So just to back up a little bit for those that don't know us, we are Mike and Rachel Novak. Um, we're at Real Brokerage. We're mentor agents there to hundreds of agents across the country. I'll talk a little bit more about Real here in just a moment. Um, we're also team leaders for the Novak real estate team. So we're based out of Everett, Washington. We're both actively in production. We're not some internet guru that tells you to do shit that we're not doing ourselves, okay? So I sell about $45 million a year in real estate. Rachel's right there with me as well. Um, but we're in the trenches with our agents and with you as an agent selling homes, okay? So we understand the pain points. We understand the lifestyle and the, the problems that come with this industry, okay? We've been married. It's going to be 15 years in July. Holy crap. I'm so proud of you, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, you deserve an yes. award of some kind. So. Uh, and we've got three incredible kids. You can see them there in that photo. That's us just hanging out down in Scottsdale. Uh, Maya is 14, Teo is 12, and little Phoebe is the wild child, and she's the seven-year-old that you see there in the middle. Um, we both love to travel and lift weights. Like Rachel's a female meathead, and uh, so we both go to the gym a lot, and our passion, like our favorite thing to do is to travel internationally. So um, that is a huge deal to us. And it's something we're starting to expose our children mm -hmm. as well. So enough about us though. I want to talk about real for just a minute. So um, we have been quiet about this and I'm not going to be quiet about it any longer. I want to share with you just very quickly in 60 seconds or less about real. We went to real in 2021 and we're very hesitant to go to real. But ultimately, a lot of our friends and colleagues have moved their teams over there, including Eric Hatch, who's a good mentor and friend of ours. He brought his 55-person team to Real, and that definitely got our attention. In 2021, they only had 2,300 agents, and we got a chance to talk to Tamir, the CEO of Real, and really understand his values and his vision for this company. We talked to our team about it and then ultimately decided to take that leap of faith. And it is the best thing we've ever done for our business. Rachel and I talk about this all the time. Like This is truly a blessing for our team members and for our family. Some of the things we love about it, the 85-15 splits are incredible. The $12,000 cap, which was $21,000, we're at Keller Williams, and our team gets either a $4,000 or $6,000 cap, depending on the team size. The revenue share opportunity really creates massive collaboration so we can do things like this and share with people what we're doing that's successful, gives us a vested interest in their business. And then, of course, the stock grants and purchase plan for retirement are badass, too. Like, you truly have a retirement plan when you're in a company like real. So that's my 60 second spiel on real. Reach out to Rachel or I, we would love to have a conversation with you about it and share with you how big of a deal this has been for our family and our business. So let's jump right into it. The rules. Rule number one, my friends, implement a weekly financial review. Oh, this is a simple one, but not that easy to do consistently. I see people yeah. try this and they're awesome for a week or two and then they just stop. So don't be that guy. Here's why a weekly review makes a lot of sense, guys. If you wait a month to look at your financials, it's too late to fix things. You're looking at a rear view mirror of what happened in your business. Otherwise known as last month's P&L, profit and loss, okay? That does not help you. So what I want you to do and what we do is we look at financials each and every week, sometimes daily, 
It depends on what's going on, but I, I will look at the team financials every single day, sometimes with our director of operations, okay? But Rachel and I have a time set on our schedule. In fact, it was today, Thursday. It was an hour before we got on this webinar. Clock, yeah. We do a deep dive into our personal finances. And we used to do our team finances at this time too, but we've moved that to a different meeting now with our director of operations because she has complete PL responsibility. But if you don't have a director of operations, you should do both of these things at the same time. Go ahead and review your team financials or your business financials and separate from that review, your personal financials, okay? Mm -hmm. um, this is going to allow you to make faster decisions, adjust to trends that are going on and pivot much, much quicker. It's also going to allow you to make data back decisions. I can't tell you how many times I talk to agents and they're telling me about how they feel about something. And I love feelings until you're making decisions for a business. And then I want facts, okay? And so this really helps when you have the facts to guide you on what to do. And the facts come from your PL. Where are you making money and where are you losing money? Okay. So um, very, very important. And just pick a day of the week, schedule half an hour or 40 minutes. It'll get faster as you do them more often, as your financials get cleaner. Um, and, and start doing this. If you've got a spouse, I highly recommend doing it with your spouse. It's Rachel and I that do this together. It's not just me doing this. So there's complete buy-in from both of us on this process. It's not just one person. I want to share with you. Um, the reports we look at, I put them up on the screen there just in case you want to take a screenshot of that. The balance sheet. So what is a balance sheet? For those that don't know, it's going to show your balances in real time for all of your accounts. So your checking account, your savings account, your investment accounts. It's going to show your assets. It's also going to show your liabilities all in one sheet. Okay. So a balance sheet is something you want to look at current as of today. It doesn't do a ton of help or good to look at a balance sheet that's two weeks old. Okay, so look at the balance sheet today, and that's going to tell you exactly how much cash that you have on hand. And we'll use that information later to make some decisions. Okay, the next one, the P and L, and I like to look at month to date and year to date. And I'll sometimes look at last month too, in particular if it's the first week of the new month. So, like you know, let's say it's May fifth. I want to look at last month's PL in that meeting and make sure I know exactly where we made money, where we lost money, where all of our income came from, and where all of our expenses were incurred as well. Okay. Um, the budget versus actual is another one. So that that basically compares and contrasts what you forecasted, aka a budget that you had in QuickBooks, versus what you actually did. So this is hard to do at the team level because you've got lots and lots of unpredictable expenses coming up, like listing expenses and things like that. But for salaries and legion, it's pretty easy to do. Um, things like rent, it's not hard to do either. At the personal level, it's very simple to do because most of your personal expenses are very easy to forecast and it's not nearly as complex. So we've created a budget. We gave it to our bookkeeper. He loaded it up into QuickBooks. And we're able to look at this report that shows us exactly where we're on track or off track. And just allows us to make better decisions, okay? So, Hold on just a sec, honey. I yep. want to interject here a second, because if you're anything like me and you've never really used QuickBooks, well, this was me prior, and you never have really put together P&L, which is a profit and loss statement, and you've never thought about doing a budget versus actual, then you're probably swimming in all of these terms like I was, right? Michael ran a really high powered development business from 2003. I came in and started working with him in 2005. So that's my entrepreneurship started then. I didn't know any of this. This was like freaking Greek to me. I could not understand what he was talking about. I couldn't wrap my head around what the hell, what the hell are you talking about? And why are all these different and what are they? So let me start with something super simple. Number one, create a monthly budget and we'll get into it in a little bit but the second thing you need to truly do is invest in your own knowledge go on youtube or go on you know quickbooks online and literally start educating yourself and get financially literate you need as a business owner as somebody who's able to generate multiple five figures multiple six figures a year in in revenue in your business and real estate you need a financial literacy course constantly. Okay. So I, I just had to interject there because I know how um, intimidating that this, this subject can be. And I know how confusing all these different things are. So please set yourself up with some homework over the next couple of weeks. It's boring AF. It is not very fun, especially when you're still learning what it all means, but absolutely take the time to spend an hour or two a week watching YouTube videos and understanding what all these terms mean. Okay, 
You yeah, you, you've got a responsibility as a business owner, which if you're a real estate agent, you're probably a business owner. Even if it's a very mm-hmm. small, uh, you know, macro business to understand exactly what these terms mean, what these financial statements mean. I can't tell you how many times I've had people that can't explain to me the difference between a balance sheet and a P&L. They don't understand, you know, assets versus expenses and things like that. So um, there's just some important basics you have to understand. Um, and, And I'll give you some tips on how to hire great professionals today too, so that you're not the only one doing this. You're surrounding yourself with people that can help you set up really good systems and help you get this all going. Um, but that budget versus actual is a super important report. Okay. I also like to look at a rolling 12 month P and L and I love this for the business. And what that's going to do is instead of showing me one month or one year of, of profit loss, it's going to separate it by months. And so I can really see like, what's the seasonality of my business and how is my expense control? Like, what did I spend on Zillow for the last 12 months by month, for example, or what were my salaries over the last 12 months? That's one that my director of operations and I looked at the other day. We're like, Hey, you know what? Our salaries are over budget. Let's look at the last 12 months and see what we've averaged per month on salaries and see if there's something that we can really do to tighten this down. Okay. And then the last one is expenses by vendor. This is one that um, we actually look at with our um, our operations team. So we, we look at it weekly in that meeting and our direct of operations brings in this report from QuickBooks and it shows us exactly where money was spent dollar for dollar with every single vendor we do business with. It's not necessarily needed on the personal side, on the business side. It's absolutely essential to hold your dollars accountable. And sometimes I'll see stuff on there. I'm like, Why the hell are we still paying that? We stopped using that service six months ago, okay? So this is where you start really catching those things that seem like they're insignificant and small, but they actually add up to hundreds and thousands of dollars per year when you just don't notice them. You likely have subscriptions that you're paying for that you don't even use. And this report will help you start to unpack those and find them, okay? And And the whole thing- Even if you're not a a, a team leader, right? It's like, say you're just a single agent or say you run a really small business or it's just you and your spouse or even just you. How often are you buying coffees for clients? What is your client gift budget? What, you know, what, how much gas are you spending every month? What kind of, you know, car maintenance are you doing? How much are you spending on signage and business cards and flyers? Like you need to know how much is actually going out for these items because it's so important as a business owner, especially as we're moving into this crazy, you know, tight market with low inventory and business might take a little bit of a hit just because there aren't as many homes to sell. We need to know, is everything that I'm putting out having a return, right? Am I getting money out of the things that I'm spending? So what is my outflow versus what is my inflow, right? That, it's so important to know that even as a single agent or a, a small business entrepreneur. Yep. And so the, what is the goal of this meeting? Well, the goal is to drive conversation strategy and change. Okay. So this should create a whole bunch of conversations about how money is being spent. And then it should start to drive into strategy. Like, Hey, maybe we need to revamp our VA strategy and have less VAs and have them doing just very specific things. Or maybe we need to take someone that's local and make them a VA and replace that position with someone that's virtual. Like it's going to drive some hard conversations that you need to lean into as a business owner. And then ultimately that's going to lead to the last part, which I said, which is the change. You have to actually be committed to changing things. Looking at a PL and analyzing it is great. However, if you don't walk away from that meeting with tactical to-dos and a list of what you're going to change, you have accomplished absolutely nothing, okay? So I want to make sure that they're very clear about that. So that's rule number one. This is the most important one. I got to be super honest with you. We put it early in here because we want to make sure that you really sunk your teeth into this in case you had to leave early. Rule number one, get that freaking weekly financial review done. Stop looking at it from a monthly perspective, okay? And pro tip. If you are in business with your spouse and you are doing this together because you run the company or you run the business together, plan your date afterward. Literally like make, make it so like you have to get this business, like BS, you know, boring stuff out of the way and then go do something fun together afterward because it is so tough, especially the first year or the first couple of months or first couple of weeks of doing this. It it is not fun at all. It is yucky. (laughs) So plan something fun afterward. Yeah, no, we've definitely gotten in some fights over these conversations. <laughs> what the hell was that $1,500 for? I don't know. You know. So anyways, it drives conversations and it drives change. <laughs> Sometimes those yeah. are positive conversations, but they're ultimately good. Um, rule number two, run your family like a business, okay? And I'm not talking about like being a hard-ass boss at home with your kids, guys. I'm talking about running the financial side of it like you run it like a business, okay? So we have a totally separate set of financials that are maintained just like our team financials for us personally. So we use QuickBooks. We've got a QuickBooks online file for our team. 
And then separate from that, we have one for us personally. When we implemented this about four years ago, our money tracking went to the next level, okay? So this was a game changer for us. The chart of accounts, like the things that you code things to are totally different for personal than they are for business. So Rachel, I did a lot of thinking, like what are the things that we should have that we wanna track? So we have categories and they're like, you know, household expenses, like insurance, like, you know, landscape maintenance, things like that. And then we've got things like gym expenses, supplements, we've got grocery budgets, we've got clothing budgets. Like they're all like grouped in a way that it makes sense. If you want a copy of our personal chart of accounts, that's what's called your chart of accounts. Send send Rachel or I a DM and we'll send you a copy of it or have our um, our bookkeeper send you a copy so you can see what that looks like. But they're unique and different to really everyone because we all spend money just a little bit differently. But the biggest thing is figure out what your system is going to be and start using it. Some people will start with a spreadsheet. That's totally fine. But as you get more sophisticated, you start moving more money around and your wealth starts building. I want you to invest in something more like QuickBooks or QuickBooks itself. I realize it's 75 bucks a month, but it really is the difference between knowing exactly what's happening and not really being sure where your money's all going. Okay. So I know it's a little bit of an expense, but it's one that's totally worth doing. Yeah. Utilizing that $75 a month software will save you more than that every single month in just the, having the organization to, to use it. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I want you to write a budget for your family and don't you write it, like pull your spouse into this. That, that's one thing that I definitely learned during this. Like I was always the driver for the financial stuff. And I would just be like, Hey, here's a budget for us to go run off of. And the big mistake with that is now there's no buy-in from the spouse. So learn from that mistake that I made and enroll your spouse into that process and just say, Hey, honey, you know, I'd really like us to start um, tracking how we're spending our money a little bit more and holding it accountable, holding all of our dollars accountable. Could we sit down for maybe half an hour, an hour and write out what our family budget's going to be? and then stick to that. Like having a budget is great. We got to be committed to sticking to it as well. Okay. So great write that. But, what's that? I said, it's a great point on this because I have to share that when I first kind of came into, you know, being in business with Michael and we're in business together and been in this business together for a really long time, calling it a budget feels so restrictive for me. And for me, I, like we work really hard. And so, you know, you've never had those like months where you're like, man, I have busted my ass. I have four, five, six closings this month. I'm going to go treat myself, right? Like I have, you have these months where you're like, I don't want to be on a budget. Like that's restrictive. I work my ass off for what I have. So we actually now call it, even though it says budget on here, we call it a spending plan. So if I have organization with where I can spend money that is pre, you know, designed together, we put this, this whole plan together, but I know I'm, I, I'm not budgeted, but I have a plan for spending for whatever reason that that tricked me enough in my mind to be able to stick to it a little bit better. So if you need language pattern tips, you connect with me afterward on this because I got all the tricks on this. I, I know that that's a subtle shift, but it actually changes the paradigm a little bit from restrictive to freedom. So it's, it's yes. a good one to definitely consider. Um, but so write your budget, write it with your spouse give it to your bookkeeper, have them upload it into QuickBooks or whatever financial system you're going to use to track it. We started on Mint back in the day because Mint was free, um, but ultimately Mint could not report at the level that we wanted. So that's when we went to QuickBooks, but Mint was how we got started with all this, just so you know. Um, and then start measuring those budget versus actuals. Look at those every single week in your review. And then I want to share with you just a little trick that we kind of developed. And actually, I got to give credit to Eric Hatch because he was while he was called our business coach, he was kind of like a marriage therapist too. Like we'd get on these coaching calls with him and we'd both come in there, you know, fire blazing at each other about all of these, uh, you know, bones to pick with one another. And he'd be like, all right, calm down, calm down, calm down. A lot of the stuff was like money related. Right. And he'd be like, okay, Mike, I understand that you want to run things with a budget and have discipline and structure. And Rachel, I understand that um, you just want to have a great life and live fun. Uh, so how do we balance these two things? And he was like, okay, let's create slush funds. And so we started doing slush funds and we set a, part, a, a dedicated amount each month for Rachel, a dedicated amount for myself. We know exactly how much that is going to be. And you have complete autonomy to do whatever you want with that money. And no questions asked. If Rachel wants to go spend $300 on nails, whatever, that's that's how she can use her slush fund, right? Or lashes, whatever, sorry. Um, well, I, this is like the, how I explain it is literally like, you know, if, if we have, if we're keeping this kind of strict spending plan and we're keeping this very detailed account of where every penny goes, it is so 
is so key to be able to build our long-term wealth, obviously, and retain all that hard-earned money that we've been working for. But at the same time, how do I buy my husband a gift on Father's Day? How do I surprise him on his birthday if I'm constantly having to report every single penny that I get paid? It feels micromanaging to me. So the slush fund was like the key for me to be able to say, okay, I've got this much money every month or that this month it changes depending on the month. I've got this much money next month. I could literally pull it out cash and he would never ask what I do with that money. I could flush it down the toilet. Not that I would ever do that, but if I could flush it down the toilet and he would have no say because we pre-arranged, pre-agreed that we have complete autonomy with how we spend that amount of money that month. It is a game changer for marriage, for relationships, for the ability to have that autonomy and the ability to spend money in ways that you want to, no matter what it's on, even if it's on other people or yourself. So the slush fund was the key for us to be able to have the freedom to spend the money that we work so hard for and yet maintain the spending plan because we're trying to really, obviously we want to build that wealth at the same time. So that is the key. And our slush funds, I'm not going to say what they are, but they're less than 2% of our total income, just so you guys know. Um, like it's, it's a pretty small amount, but it does accomplish the goal of having accountability yet also providing freedom and autonomy. So it, it's a really great solution. The the biggest thing that you need to do if you're going to do slush funds is you need to have a commitment on how much they're going to be. You need to not micromanage what they spend if it's in their slush fund. And then you need to make sure that if something is not falling within line in a budget and you haven't talked about it, it's going to go to a slush fund. Like it's got to go into that as the default. Okay. You can't just start overspending on your budget. So if it's over budget on a line item, it now goes into a slush fund. If you do those things, you're going to be in great shape. Okay. Anything else on number two, Rachel? No, it's one of your favorites. No, I, I think that like that's that really was one of the the keys for us to be able to have these financial meetings every week and it not turn into a really big emotional argument, you know, like, hey, I've got autonomy. And if I if I this month want to spend max out that entire amount, awesome. I don't do that every month, right? Like maybe I won't spend it all this month. But the, the ability to have that autonomy is so incredibly key. And then it makes me feel like I do get to spend some of that hard-earned cash, right? So, and sometimes we agree, like, like I just kind of answered Vincent too. It's a flat amount that we choose each month and we pre-discuss the month before. So if we have Christmas coming up or if we have a birthday coming up that next month, we'll discuss like, hey, can we extend these? Do we need to shrink them this month to make up for it last month, right? We discuss it prior to so that we know going into the month exactly how much we have to spend. Awesome. That brings us to rule number three. Um, we call this the 888 rule. And this is one that is really important at the team or business level. Okay. And so what this means, it's very simple. You're just going to cap your lead generation spend at 8% of your gross GCI. And I'm going to give you a few examples. I'm just going to share with you one of our PLs that breaks down exactly what this looks like and how to calculate it. The second one, 8% max salaries, not including yours as an owner. We're going to talk about how to pay yourself as an owner of your company, even if you're just a single agent, which you need to do for taxes. Um, but you need to spend a max of 8% on that. And then the third category is kind of the catch-all. That's called general overhead. So everything that's not in lead generation, that's not in salaries, is now in general. And that's where I see a lot of misses for people. Like they're pretty good at managing their lead gen spend. They're pretty good at managing salaries, but where they run into problems is all those little expenses that add up. Again, back to the subscriptions you're not using, all this tech that you've got for your team, those all would fall into that general overhead expense category. And if you can keep that at 8%, and keep the other two at eight, you're going to be spending about 24% to run your team, which puts you in a very profitable place. Most teams run, you know, a lot of teams run like a 60-40 split where the team retains 60% and the, the person gets paid 40%, depending on if it's a buy side or a sell side, or they run the 50-50 model if they've got agents that have been around for a long time, like we've got a few like that that are on those um, higher and better splits. And so if you just think about it, 50 cents of every dollar is going to that agent's commission. 50 cents is coming to the team. This allows us to hold on to 26 cents as profit. So you're turning a 26% profit, which is pretty good if you're able to have the structure and discipline to actually do this, okay? So let me show you some examples. So this is a copy of the Novak Teams P&L. And at the top, you're gonna see all of the incomes, okay? So you can see, like, I want you to look at the total income number. That's the one that is very important here. This is otherwise known as GCI in real estate, gross commission income. So the team did $327,576 in April. That was their total commissions, okay? And that number is very important. I want you to write that number down when you're going through this exercise. 
The first number we're going to crunch is the total lead generation. So you can see if I look down towards the bottom part of the screen, it's broken down by category, advertising and marketing, Facebook, PCSOI, PPC, you've got some Zillow, some YouTube, um, all these other things going on. So the total amount of those expenses was $25,666. That comes out to 7.8%. Okay, so I'm good. I'm under 8%. And of course, I would want to make sure that each one of these lead sources is giving me a positive ROI. We use CISU for that, CISU, S-I-S-U, for all of our lead source ROI reporting. So you got to hold your lead gen dollars accountable to make sure they're actually giving you a positive ROI return on investment. But this is the first number you want to crunch. How much did you spend on total lead gen? And that's exactly how you do it, okay? The second number is the total overhead. And so if you look at the bottom, you can kind of see it. I know this is a lot to look at, but down below it says total overhead, $30,746, okay? And again, I'm gonna divide that number by the 327 number, which is the GCI, and that comes out to 9.3%. So I overspent on overhead last month, okay? And so that's gonna, again, drive conversation and drive strategy and drive change. What can I do to get this number back in check next month so we don't repeat the process. And if I'm looking at this every week, I can go ahead and pivot during the week as well. Okay, so again, the goal is 8%, we ran 9.3, so we're a little bit over. The last one is payroll. So you, our payroll is a little bit complicated because we separate our, our owner pay. Um, and then we've got health insurance, which I don't add in there. So just the taxes down below for the employees was $2,488 and then $30,701 was their total wages, okay? So the total amount that we paid our staff was 33,189. Um, and if you, again, divide that by that 327, you kind of get your number on where it was. I think that comes out to like 9.1% or something like that. Okay. So it's it's not far off, but it's not perfect either. So when you put these three categories together on the PL, you can see that for the big three, we spent $89,591 that month, which came out to 27.3%. Remember, the target was 24%. So I need to figure out how can I make up 3.3% next month and improve my spending. We never, ever, ever bank on increasing revenue. That is a dangerous slope to be on. I've seen teams and agents where they're just like, I'm just going to go sell more. Okay. And that's awesome. I hope you do that, but set your expenses on what you're actually selling now. Okay. Don't try to outspend your way to the top on creating your revenue. Okay. Any questions on that? Does that all make sense, Rach? Yeah. I mean, this is the, this is what, you know, we warned you this is the not sexy, important stuff, right? When, especially that general overhead, like when we're looking at our expenses to our vendors every single month, what kind of, what, what are we spending, you know? And are, how are you justifying it? Are you justifying it as part of the business? Is there a return coming in from that? And then like you mentioned, Michael, the other important part is not spending your way into more business. Right. I think there's a lot of people that over the last couple of months have been waffling between, Oh, spending more for lead gen so I can get more leads so I can, you know, do more business. Well, it's like, okay, if that, that's a, that's an investment. If you can do that, that's great. But it, what are you actually doing? What is year over year trends? What is month to, to date trends? What is your team actually selling? What are you actually selling? What can you base your, the lowest possible overhead on, right? That's what you really want to look at. So. Yep. Um, that brings us to rule number four, uh, paying off debt. This is something where we're a little bit different than most people. We've been through um, really rough financial times before we lost everything in 2008. And that changed my perspective and Rachel's as well. We lost our house. Um, we lost over $7 million in investment properties as well in construction projects. And so what we learned from that is a lesson that I believe will stick with us for the rest of our lives and probably even carry to our children. And that is to carry no debt. Like debt just does not align with our values. So I understand that debt gives you leverage sometimes, especially when you're like buying apartment buildings and it creates cash flow and appreciation and tax benefits. And that's all fine. But I want to talk, I want to consider that like business debt. And I want to talk about personal debt. Okay. Personal debt is like consumer debt. And so we don't believe in holding consumer debt. And the, the best thing you can do is start to pay this off. And the way you pay it off is get three months of reserves in your business, get three months of reserves minimum personally, and then start allocating every extra dollar into paying off debt. And I put down the list of priorities on how to pay it off. Start with your credit cards, look at your highest rate end of charge card and pay that sucker off as fast as possible. Once you've paid off all your credit cards, go move on to your RV or your boat and pay those suckers off too. Most of those have much higher interest rates than cars do. That's why cars are number three. If you have an interest rate between zero and 2%, 
it may make sense just to hold on to that because you're basically getting free money at that point. Um, but I only think that applies to your car. Okay. Like I, I think that toys need to be paid for. Um, it, I, I understand maybe you financed it to start with, but you should pay that thing off as fast as you possibly can. And before you start making big investments with your cash into additional income producing activities, pay off your debt. So you have less stress and you live a less leveraged lifestyle. And again, I realize this isn't what everyone else is telling you to do. It's what we do because of what we've experienced. Okay. Um, the last thing to pay off is the house. Like when you pay off your house, you totally have financial freedom. You're completely set free at that point. You, it, it feels amazing when you get to that level. Very few people get there, but when you do, it is a complete game changer for the kind of life that you can live. I know for us, like we used to really value having a lot of money. And in the last few years that shifted to having a lot of freedom. It's hard to have a lot of freedom if you have a 10 or $15,000 a month mortgage payment. Okay. So I recommend paying off your house as soon as you can. I know, again, I know this isn't typical advice that you hear in real estate circles. People say, leverage yourself. I don't believe in that. I believe in paying off debt. I believe then investing your cash makes sense at that point. Okay. Um, so this is a really, question. Yeah. Somebody yeah. asked a question here about um, how would you prioritize debt payoff if you had previous years of taxes? This is a great question. Are taxes prioritized hmm. over credit cards? So no, they're not. I would pay credit cards first and then taxes. Um, However, the caveat, I, in my opinion, Michael, you can, you can answer separately, but get get yourself on some sort of plan. Like well, what you yeah, the, the, the yeah. Like you, don't, you don't want to get in a situation where you're just not paying anything towards them. And then you've got penalties stacking up with taxes. Right? Well, so if you're in a payment plan with the IRS, they will stop assessing penalties on you. Right. That that's important to know because we we've guys we've duked it out with the IRS multiple times and audits and things like that. I I know firsthand what it's like to deal with them. And if you're in a payment arrangement with them, they will not charge you penalties. They will charge you interest. And you should look at what that interest rate is. If it's higher than a credit card, then pay it off first. If it's not, pay it off second. Um, but keep making your monthly payments that you committed to on the tax plan. Don't default on that to yeah. pay your credit cards. I want to be very clear about that. And whatever you agreed to pay, pay that. Whatever's left over, pay off your credit cards and look at the interest rate you're paying the IRS. Um, it's been a long time since I've had a payment plan at the IRS. I don't know what they charge. Um, and then contrast that to the credit cards. Okay. But do get your taxes caught up. Like you're, you're not going to be able to move forward feeling good about things until your taxes are current. Like we're, we're not really doing a big breakdown on taxes today, but um, we really have put into place some structure that helps us manage taxes. Cause at this point in our careers, taxes are our single largest expense bar none. And you need some serious strategy on how to deal with that. I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute, actually. All right, let's move on to rule number five. You need to hire professionals. And I, I, I like I told you, I, I want you to save money and be stingy in certain areas, not here. I want you to hire the best people you can possibly afford to give you guidance when it comes to running your finances. It's kind of like hiring an attorney. You get what you pay for, right? You don't want that brand new attorney that charges $250 an hour and takes 20 hours to figure out something that an experienced attorney could figure out in an hour or two. So don't be a cheap ass when it comes to hiring professionals. But these are the three people you need. At a minimum, you need a bookkeeper. And that bookkeeper is going to do things like your monthly bank reconciliation, comparing what actually went through your bank account versus what's in your financials, making sure that the financials are accurate by doing that bank recon. Um, they do cost coding as well. Like for us, our bookkeeper does our team cost coding. And then Rachel and I do our personal cost coding. That's done every single day at the team level. And it's done weekly for us personally. Okay. So you need a good bookkeeper. They will also help you set up your QuickBooks files and your chart of accounts. We pay our bookkeeper. He's a contractor out of New York. He's awesome to work with. We pay him $250 a week, which isn't cheap, but it's money well spent because he's super accessible. He's very good at what he does. He's also an accountant. So um, he's very knowledgeable when it comes to helping us. And he helped us set up both our personal and our business financials in QuickBooks. He's like a QuickBooks ninja. So anything that I need done in there, he can do, and he can do it quickly and accurately. And he does a full reconciliation every month. So when my month, the monthly statements come out, we literally download the statements from all of our bank accounts, send them to him, and he does a full reconciliation through all of QuickBooks on all of the accounts. Right. And if you have a good bookkeeper and you're doing these weekly financial reviews we're talking about, tax time gets super freaking easy because your bookkeeper has financials that are done January 2nd. He gives them to your accountant and your accountant starts preparing your taxes. It's beautiful when it all happens like that. It takes a while to get there. But once you're there, it's pretty freaking cool. Okay. The next one is the CPA. Oh man, I've gone through some really crappy CPAs in our days. Like there, there's some really bad ones out there. I would ask around in your area, like who other business owners use. I'd ask them what they pay for their taxes. You know, again, don't look for the cheapest person, look for the best. 
Um, the person can make or break what you're paying in taxes. They can also make or break if you're going to get audited and how well that audit goes. So be very choosy. And I would go off of a referral for a CPA. Our CPA that we found that we really like now is actually like a personal friend that Rachel knew from CrossFit. And then she became a client and she's just really good. Um, but it took us like three CPAs to get there. So it can take a little bit of trial and error. If it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. And you should keep looking until it does feel right. Okay. But ask around in your local area until you find the right person. The CPA is going to help you with tax strategy. Like, how do I minimize the amount of taxes I'm going to pay? Um, obviously, you need to pay your fair share, but who wants to pay more than what they absolutely have to pay? That's the CPA's job. They're going to also estimate your quarterly tax payments. Just a heads up, and our CPA told us this last year, the IRS has increased the penalty if you don't pay quarterly tax estimates, okay? That means you're prepaying your taxes for next year, basically this year. So like, you know, we had to prepay our first quarter taxes um, by a certain deadline, estimating how much money we made in the first quarter and then pay the tax bill on it. But the, I can't remember what the fees are on it now, Rachel, but isn't it like 6% the IRS has raised it to if you don't do that? It's a massive penalty, guys. I think it was like three in the threes and it's up to like six or six, almost seven. Like yeah, it's going to cost you big time if you're not making quarterly tax payments. So talk to your CPA about that and make sure you're doing that. Um, they're also gonna complete your business and personal tax returns, which is very simple. If you've done your job and your bookkeeper's done their job on having accurate financials that are looked at and reviewed every single week, okay? That brings us to the third one, the bulldog out of the three, the tax attorney. So I have two tax attorneys that both complete assholes. Like a tax attorney is a really interesting individual because they're an accountant, like a CPA, but they're also like a litigation specialist attorney. And these people are brilliant. They're super expensive. Um, these are the guys that challenge tax code. When we sued the IRS in 2012 with a different business, this is the route we went. Like we hired a tax attorney to represent us and he won. It was awesome. It cost us $30,000 to sue the IRS, but it was it was, it was money well spent because we ended up owing nothing, right? So um, a tax attorney is going to help you with complicated IRS matters. Um, any tax litigation, like I said, like we've gone through, um, really complex tax strategy, and they should also do your business and entity formation. So when you want to open up a new LLC, have your tax attorney do it for you so it's set up correctly. It's going to cost you a little bit more, but you're going to make sure it's set up right, okay? So um, I definitely recommend getting a tax attorney um, like on speed dial. You don't need that person right away, but you're going to need them at some point. And the sooner you have that badass, um, the better off you're going to be. Expect on the CPA side of things to pay five to $10,000 a year for taxes um, and tax preparation and guidance. On the tax attorney, expect to pay five to $700 an hour if you're getting a true badass. And but, you shouldn't need them all the time, right? Like no, this, no th these are not on retainer typically. Right. These are guys that like, you know, mm -hmm. when when the IRS says, hey, we're auditing you, that that's the first person you call, right? Yeah. So yeah. you meet fire with fire and that's what tax attorneys do. Whew, we're right. making progress. Yep. Rule number all six. Right. All right. Rule number Do you, so, <laughs> you want to talk about this one, Rach? Absolutely. Yes. Right. So this is one thing that it took us uh, quite a bit of time to kind of figure out the best way to pay ourselves, not just for tax purposes, not just for organization of the business, but to really encompass everything that we do. Because number one, we're real estate agents, right? Mike and I go out there and we help clients and we serve them and we help them buy and sell houses. But number two, we run a business. So we run a platform and we organize operations of a business that helps the agents on our team all run their businesses. We have infrastructure, we have salaried employees, we have support people. So that's another whole part of the job, right? And as a business owner, which you are, so if you are, even if it's just you, if you're running a sole proprietor, a single person business, you should still be paying yourself as an owner as well as paying your personal commission. So how we do it. Number one, we pay ourselves a salary. Each of us get a salary because each of us have a heavy hand in the organization and the running of our business, right? We have different AORs, we have different areas of responsibility within the business, but we both are owners and we both run it. So for us in our market, we, we do have pretty low salary. I think it's 40,000 that we run our salary um, like per year, annual salary. Um, but that also helps pay for a health insurance that we run through our company. So that's, that's not really. That's important is like we set up health insurance at your team level if you can and mm -hmm. pay it with pre-tax dollars. The other big thing, and I'm sure you're coming to this, Rachel, is that you have to pay yourself a salary 
or you're out of compliance with tax code, okay? You can be assessed what's called self-employment tax if you're not paying yourself what's deemed a reasonable salary by the IRS because you're basically bypassing paying payroll taxes on yourself, okay? So the IRS is getting screwed out of about 15% when you're not paying yourself as a salaried position on your organization. So you have to at least pay what they would consider the minimum reasonable for somebody to do your position, which for us, We've been audited. We already agreed and established that it was 40000 a person. So that's the number. That's that's probably on the low side, but it's enough to keep, so, keep us tax compliant. Exactly right. And, and you know, like Michael said, it's, it is so incredibly important to understand that paying yourself a W-2 now will save you so much money in the self-employment taxes. We messed up on this. This is how we've learned most of our lessons, unfortunately, which is one of the reasons Mike and I are so open and wanting to share all of these things that we've learned because guys, we messed it up. We totally screwed ourselves over. And so we learned the hard way, paying yourselves a W-2 salary as the owner of your business, right? The owner of the LLC of your real estate business, that is an absolute must when it comes to one of the ways to pay yourselves, okay? Number two, personal commissions. Now, a lot of real estate agents who come into the business don't think about their business like a business, right? They just come in, they put their name on like the, the, the commission disbursement, and then they get a check from escrow. And then it goes into their personal bank account. Guys, this can be a very big problem, especially for taxes. So set yourself up that LLC or sole proprietor, right? Become an escrow or C corp or however your CPA and tax attorney says to do that but pay into the business, have escrow directly pay or the attorneys directly pay your business entity, then the business entity can give you a split. So for Mike and I, we pay ourselves a split of our personal commissions exactly like the agents on our team. So just like all of the agents on our real estate team, we pay in 50 or 40 or whatever the, the split is for that lead source into the team and then we get the other split of our personal commissions personally. Okay. Why so do we do that? Again? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why do we pay ourselves personal commissions? Oh, because yeah. we're real estate agents. <laughs> well, so the big reason why is because we want to have true bottom line profit on our financial statements, right? If, if we don't pay ourselves personal commissions, it makes your company look like it's much more profitable than it actually is. Right. That's the big problem. Like when I talk to agents and they're like, yeah, my profit margin's 45%. I'm like, awesome. How do, how do you pay yourself? And they're like, oh, uh, I, I don't. I just like profit at the end of the month. Like that's that's not an accurate way to run your organization. All right. You got to pay yourself a commission just like you're an agent on your team. What if you're no longer in production? Well, you need to know how much production you need to replace of your own with somebody else before you step out of it. So this gives you true, honest bottom line profitability when you do this. You're not distorting that number and inflating it because you've actually paid yourself as an agent on your team for those personal transactions. That's super important. So we've got a good question here from Christine. She says, do you pay yourself a split as a distribution? I want to say yes. Yeah, I believe, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I'd have to ask our <laughs> CPA. <laughs> Whatever our CPA told us to do, that's how we do it. Um, so but it's I, essentially, I we essentially it. have our entity, our LLC company pay us personally. So when we book it personally, it's literally transferring from the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet of the business, and we get a check deposited into our personal account. So now it's a, called a personal commission for ourselves. But yes, it is a distribution. Christine. Yeah, that's a distribution then. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is when there is profit, we pay ourselves a profit. Now, one thing that Mike and I, he, he blazed over it a couple of rules ago, but we keep a minimum amount of capital in the business at all times. We need to make sure that we've got at least, I think two or three full months of business overhead to like staying as liquid money, as capital in the business before we pay ourselves profit. So we, with our director of operations have established what that number is for our company, for our business. And then once a quarter, we will look at that bottom line number, looking at the PL, looking at the balance sheet and anything over that number. So keeping that capital in the business we will distribute to ourselves as a distribution the profit from that quarter. Okay. Anything else to add to that one, Michael? No, I think you can change it to monthly too. Like if you're if you don't want to wait a whole quarter, like it's okay to do that monthly as long as you're holding enough money in your company to cover those three or four months of payroll and lead generation expenses. Those are like the big ones to make sure you've got plenty of cushion on. So mm -hmm. I think we're good there. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Rule number seven, auto withdraw your investment funds. So we do this every single month. um, And basically we just have an auto withdrawal set up with our financial planner and she pulls out a certain amount of dollars. And then we just pretend like it never even existed. Like those are, those are monies we don't want to see for years. We just forget they even came into us and it's just pulled right out of our account. So I like to tell people to start with like 10 or 15% to start with that habit of doing it and then increase it and scale it up as you're consistent with it. Okay. So just start doing it. And um, I, I can't give you like financial planner recommendations necessarily. You just, again, got to ask around and try to see where people are really happy at. Um, we, we, we're not like big, um, you know, on like the big corporate stuff when it comes to financial advisors, we have someone who actually owns their firm that does our financial planning and she's really good. And she works really closely with our CPA as well. Cause a, a lot of times your financial planning and your accounting, like for tax purposes, they tie very directly together with things like IRAs and 401ks and things like that. So um, just start doing it. Um, And ultimately, like, you you know, the guidance I gave my financial plan was just don't lose my money. Like, I don't want to see the money for years. Um, Don't take massive risks with it. And she's averaged like eight or 9% return year over year. year. I I want to be really clear, like to, to accentuate your point, Michael, about starting small, like you don't have to start with a big chunk of investment, but it should make you a little bit uncomfortable. You should be like, shoot, that's like another payment essentially, right? So you can afford it. So if you've created a spending plan and you see the amount of money that you have kind of left over, don't just let that sit in a low interest savings account. Don't just let that sit in your checking account, right? Get with a financial advisor, get an account, a money market, a community investment, property account open and have it transferred every single month make it a little bit uncomfortable i know that there's some months that we're kind of like oh boy like okay well that's we know that's coming out on the 10th like so let's make sure that cup is covered right it that that's how you're going to maintain long term a lot of this wealth now a lot of people are going to say oh well i'm I'm buying investment properties and i'm doing that that's awesome like it you totally should be if it makes sense if you're in an area where you can cash flow and that that instead of going into investment account your money's going into real estate that's awesome part of our wealth strategy plan is simply to have that money market account that is making eight to nine consistent percent every single year so that's how we do it um mark asked a question here mike just in regards to finding good professionals for everybody Hard to know what, what who to trust, what is reasonable. You, you know, Mark, like Mike said, I think ask people in your area. All of the people that we work with were either from our network, from our client base, or a recommendation of a, a professional in our market. Um, it, and our CPA, our, or sorry, our bookkeeper was actually someone that we found on Upwork originally. Um, and we've built, we just built a relationship with him and we used him really lightly at first. And then as he kind of proved his consistency, his communication, his knowledge to us, I think we've been with him for like five or six years now. So um, it really is some of it, maybe a little bit of trial and error, um, but some of it is definitely going to be personal recommendations as well. On the financial advisor uh, part, I would urge you to hire a fiduciary. Um, There are companies out there, some of them are very big, well-known financial investment companies, and they are not fiduciaries. And so they're getting actual higher commissions when they push you on certain products. And I don't think that that's in your best interest. So um, Edward Jones, just to name one, is the biggest one out there. Um, Be very, very careful when there's a conflict of interest and the person is making more money if they sell you certain investment products, okay? In particular, like whole life insurance and things like that. So be, be just very careful with that. Look for a fiduciary. We pay our financial advisor, I think it's 1.25% per year, um, which isn't that much for how much she does. Like, I feel like there's a lot of value there. So good question though. Mm-hmm. Rule number eight, maybe my favorite one, um, enjoy your life. <laughs> like. <laughs> You know, guys, it's not a, there's no award for dying with the most amount of money in the bank. You need to have some fun with your day-to-day life. And this is something that for me was, it took years to realize. Like I was just like, hey, let's just stockpile as much cash as possible and we'll enjoy it later. Well, guys, shit happens to people. They, They die early. They get hit by a bus. They get paralyzed. Like weird things happen to people all the time. You don't want to be the person that just hoarded cash and miss out on some amazing life opportunities. So this is a picture of our family this last spring break where Rachel and I invested the money to take our three kids over to Greece. And we spent two weeks in Athens and Greece with them. It was an expensive trip. It cost us, you know, $18,000, $20,000. But the memories that were created there, 
worth every penny and then some. I would say that's the best return on investment you could possibly get. So I think 10 to 15% makes a ton of sense. You can even go higher than that if you're um, you know, really low debt, um, but just kind of start at that number and don't wait to start enjoying your life. You don't have to go spend massive amounts of money, but just start making sure you're enjoying it, okay? Otherwise, you're not gonna last, you're gonna burn out. We just did a long webinar about avoiding burnout. Burnout comes when you don't take the time to save and enjoy life as it's happening. Anything to add to that, Rach? No, oh, this is this is my favorite one. And I think that the biggest the biggest takeaway if you're going to from all of this is that creating these structures, creating the the spending plan, getting professionals, getting mint set up or QuickBooks set up for your personal and business wealth building, this will allow you to be able to budget. So literally when we're looking at our spending plan, Travel is prioritized as part of our budget. We literally have a travel budget every single month. And so sometimes we have to sacrifice on clothing. And sometimes we have to sacrifice, like I only get my hair done twice a year, right? I mean, there's things that I'm okay sacrificing in this area to make this happen over here. So, you know, yes, there's going to be a lot of things that if you make a lot of money and generate a lot of money, you can have your cake and then eat the whole thing too. However, to really, you want to be able to prioritize enjoying your life and being with your people and spending those time or those times and those memories. Because that's honestly, that's exactly why we're all freaking here is to enjoy our freaking life. <laughs> so. so the next steps, I always like to assign homework out of these because ultimately if you were just here to be entertained, it is not really that productive. So I want you to go implement some things out of this. First one is go hire your big three, your bookkeeper, your CPA, and your tax attorney. Go figure out who those people are going to be and get them hired and retained. Second one, um, send Rachel or I a message if you want a copy of our chart of accounts for business or personal. You give it to your bookkeeper and they can upload it into QuickBooks for you and make things much, much easier. The third one, start paying yourself all three ways. Like we talked about, pay yourself a salary, pay yourself personal commissions, and pay yourself an owner profit at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter. And then the final one, schedule time, talk to us about real. If you're curious about it, just reach out to us. At least you're going to know what you're saying no to if you're not looking at it. Okay. So awesome to hang out with you guys. We'll be back in a couple more weeks with our next webinar. Stay tuned for that. I will catch you later. See you guys.